One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. One, two, one, two. One two, one two, mic check, one two, one two, one two. Four, test one, two, three, four. Testing dies, Mike.
Committee on Education and Labor will come to come to order. I note that a quorum is present. The committee is meeting today for the Members' Day hearing. This hearing is an opportunity for members to inform the committee of their interests and priorities as it relates to the committee's jurisdiction. Members who wish to testify will sit on panels. Each member will be given five minutes to present his or her testimony orally. After members' presentation, committee members will ask uh, panelists questions if they wish, wish under the five-minute rule. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member, and I recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today for the House Committee on Education and Labor's Members' Day hearing. Today's hearing is an opportunity for the committee to hear from all members of Congress about their priorities for addressing our nation's education system, workforce, health care system, and economy. Issues within the committee's jurisdiction include a wide range of policy areas that impact Americans across the country throughout their lives from birth to retirement. Accordingly, there's not, accordingly it is not only appropriate but necessary to get input and ideas from members of Congress representing all parts of this diverse nation. Today we have the chance to engage in an open dialogue on how we can work in a bipartisan way to protect vital services and programs for our nation's schools, workplaces, health care systems, and also improve the quality of life in our communities. I want to thank all of our members for being with us today, and I look forward to our discussion. I look forward to working with all of my colleagues to ensure that America is a country where everyone can succeed. I will now recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott. Uh, thank you for yielding. Uh, be brief in my opening remarks because the whole point of it is this is Members' Day. We get the opportunity to hear uh, from members who may not uh, be on the committee. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, I know that um, we agree that this uh, truly is one of the uh, best committees in the, in the House, uh, impacting uh, Americans from the youngest Americans to the oldest and everyone in between. Our broad uh, jurisdiction can be utilized to improve their lives, make their lives better or worse. And of course, we're always striving for better. Uh, with issues and policies as diverse as the ones we cover here, every hearing has the potential to be a real learning experience. And this hearing is a fantastic opportunity to hear from colleagues that we don't always get to hear from. So save more of my thoughts for another day and simply add my welcome to our guests. Uh, yield back. Thank you. Without objection, all other committee members who wish to insert written statements for the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically by March 27th. I appreciate um, all of our witnesses for being with, you, with us today and look forward to your testimony. Uh, you know how the microphones work and what the five-minute rule means. So I'll now recognize um, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member, member Smucker and all the members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to come today and talk about priorities for your committee, in particular for me as priorities for reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. I have firsthand perspective on the importance of getting information to constituents, to families, in terms of the value and opportunities in post-secondary education. I spent over 30 years in post-secondary education as an administrator in a variety of roles. I also was the first in my extended family to ever go to college, the first one to set foot on a college campus. At the time, it was a guess. I had no idea what the outcome would be from going to college. I had a hope. Why? Because such little information was available. And I admit, it was a number of years ago, Mr. Chairman, I'm a little older now, but nevertheless, when you started asking information about the outcomes, what was the likelihood of graduating? What was the career opportunities? What could you earn from the degree I pursued? All you got was at best anecdotes. We're asking people to invest in anecdotes right now because they lack information necessary to make informed decisions. While right now, almost 45 million Americans hold 1.5 trillion in student debt. They acquired that get debt largely by guessing and hoping. We have 11.5% of student loans are 90 days or more delinquent. We can hold the higher education system accountable by empowering consumers and families to make informed decisions about their investment in post-secondary education. These days, no one would buy a car or refrigerator without being able to look, where do you go? You go online and you say, okay, what's the information on this washer or dryer? What's the information on this car? What's its reliability? You can look all that up on the internet. It's an amazing tool. 
try to find the graduation rate, the employment rate, and the earnings from the, from the nursing program at Michigan State University. I guarantee there's a difference between the architecture program and the nursing program at my alma mater. Try to find that information. If families are making massive investments for their young people in post-secondary education, and yes, taking out loans, and then sometimes the senator's saying, what do we get for this? Why do we end up in this situation? Because they have no idea, they're guessing. You're empowered, this committee's empowered to change that, to in fact give families and consumers the information they need to make informed decisions. And guess what? It's not that tricky. Consumers need that information. Policymakers need that information because they're making decisions about their institutions, and they don't have aggregate information either on programs in their institutions. And last but not least, let's be honest, employers need a talent pipeline where people are informed in terms of decisions they can make. Today, we, we, we uh, propose we submit the College Transparency Act in Congress. It's different from the last bill we had last term. I encourage the committee to look at it. We made some improvements based upon feedback from committee members, from outsiders, from various stakeholders. Last term, and we're still working on co-sponsors this year, we had 16 senators, 33 representatives, 130 organizations that supported the College Transparency Act. I believe we made it better. Let me quickly talk about what it does. It creates a post-secondary student data advisory committee empowered to create a secure database of the outcomes for students. Outcomes being how many students enrolled, how many students graduated, how many students got graduated within a reasonable time frame, by the way, how many students got employment, and what their average earnings were. Largely from data that already exists in the federal government, but our systems are so bad that they can't access that information. And it puts that information out in an aggregate database that we require colleges and universities to publish in a searchable format. The important thing is we create that committee, that advisory committee, and we give them four years to design this, to ensure its security, to ensure that information is safe. We don't want it, nobody wants that information out there. To make sure they do that with the standards in place and they can update those standards. Yesterday, the Republican leader spoke uh, before the Committee of Congress on the importance of looking at blockchain and other technologies to secure data in the federal government. We want to get them time to do that. But equally, I think we need to be focused on, and I would encourage the committee to focus post-secondary education upon advising the users, the taxpayers and the consumers, what they're putting their money into. Because as I said earlier, there's trillions of dollars invested in post-secondary education right now, and people in many cases aren't informed, and they're not getting their money worth, money's worth. Let's hold them accountable. Let's hold post-secondary education accountable by empowering the users, rather than hope, frankly, the federal government gets it right and the regulators figure it out. Because I can tell you from my 30-some years of experience, they often miss the mark. With that, I'll yield back 11 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, and I forgot to, in your introduction, I forgot to mention that you're a former member of this committee and we miss you. I miss being here. I have a tough choice to go, to go to the world of armed services, but if you let me back every now and then, I promise to behave myself. All right, sounds good. Um, Mr. Soto. Thank you, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Smucker, and members of the committee for this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, HR 827, the Artificial Intelligence Jobs Act, otherwise known as the AI Jobs Act. Uh, this bill would authorize the Department of Labor to create a report analyzing the future growth of artificial intelligence and its impacts on the workforce. I want to first start out by thanking our co-sponsors, uh, Representatives Krishnamurthy, Stefanik, Takano, Mitchell, Clark, Gallagher, Dingle, Norman, and Kana. Uh, obviously, this is a bipartisan bill. We also have innovators in the tech space supporting this bill, including Intel, Lyft, the Center for Data Innovation, the Software Alliance, and Security Industry Association. Imagine first if we could go back in time to the late 90s, early 2000s, and reanalyze uh, how this Congress reacted to something called the Internet. It was a huge uh, grower of jobs and uh, our economy, but it also had disruptions. And imagine we would better prepare ourselves, particularly for workers who are displaced, while also promoting the innovation of the internet. And now consider we are at that same juncture with regard to artificial intelligence. You think of things like Amazon, who have redefined retail in many ways, uh, or Netflix and other movie providers and how we're not renting movies 
in a store anymore as much, or Spotify or Pandora, who uh, people are streaming music, even photos. Think about the differences from 20 years ago. But then think about the workers who lost those jobs uh, at that time and uh, who are looking for a new place in the economy and making sure we're giving them the training and the tools they need. Uh, since the AI Jobs Act was introduced last Congress, President Trump also released an executive order, quote, accelerating America's leadership in artificial intelligence, which highlighted the paramount economic importance of continued American leadership in artificial intelligence. One aspect of this order focused on building the AI workforce and directed agencies to prepare our workforce with the skills needed to adapt and thrive in this new age of AI. The AI Jobs Act aligns and furthers this directive by commissioning an advisory report within the Department of Labor. Specifically, the report would collect data to analyze which industries are projected to have the most growth through artificial intelligence, and the demographics which may experience expanded careers and those whose jobs may be most vulnerable to displacement. Uh, to ensure transparency, the report will be conducted in a nonpartisan manner in collaboration with the education institutions, employers and think tanks in the tech and manufacturing sectors, and the Secretary of Commerce and the Director of Bureau of Census. Um, this bill is also supported by the innovators that I talked about. I, I think the key is this could be a template for uh, amendments from this committee for other areas uh, in artificial intelligence where we may want to be bullish on. This is the future of the economy in many sections, um, from healthcare uh, to big data to manufacturing to so many different applications we may not even contemplate at this juncture, um, but at the same time make sure workers in areas that may be disrupted well, the tools to be equipped. We cannot shirk or, uh, or uh, draw back from this opportunity, but we do and can be more prepared. Uh, and with that, I look forward to questions and, and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we'll have uh, questions from the panel members. I'll defer. Uh, gentleman from California, you'd have questions, or gentlelady from Florida, Florida gentlelady from Florida. Thank you very much. Um, forgive me for my questions, but I've been at the other end, at the Cabinet Department, when we got these kinds of uh, requirements, um, and at universities when we got these kinds of requirements. So, um, Congressman uh, Mitchell, um, I really appreciate um, and I agree with the need for transparency. Parents really need to know, even though students change their majors at least three times in the course of their college career, parents do need to know at least when they're entering an institution what the outcomes might be in terms of jobs and other kinds of things. It's easy to collect that data for professional schools, and that is nursing schools, because the students take the exam and then go right into a job. For arts and sciences majors, colleges struggle, and let me tell you why. Because so many of them don't take a job initially. They either go to graduate school and if they, for the better colleges, if they do go on to graduate school, it looks like they have no income. So it doesn't, there has to be sensitivity in that. Or they go wandering around someplace and take part-time jobs, as you know, know this new generation does. They start with internships, and it looks like their income is down. So um, uh, while I don't, I'm not opposed, I actually believe in transparency and more information, I do, I simply wanted to point out to you that this is pretty complicated for colleges and universities. It was compli obviously complicated to explain in a five minute opening as well. Yeah, I'd be exactly. happy to talk with you about it. The, the, the committee, the advisory committee's envisioned to actually address that. For example, to report the percentage of students that go on to graduate programs. It's a okay. valid outcome of a post-secondary education program. Yeah. To report the number that are employed but elect elected part-time employment. That data is available in various it databases is. the federal government has. The problem is it doesn't aggregate it and doesn't report it and doesn't do so in any safe kind of, any secure kind of manner. That's what this envisioned doing. Okay. And more importantly, let me suggest one thing, uh, ma'am, which is it also allows them to make informed decisions. I don't, for example, I don't care whether someone decides to go to Yale in art history and wants to accrue ma significant debt if that's a choice they make based on informed decisions. But when they make that guessing, 
I think that's a poor use of taxpayer money, individual monies. And I don't mean to pick on Yale, it's just well, an example. Well, you and I would prefer they go to the Big Ten. I, I would prefer, uh, Michigan yeah. State's a great school. Yes, yeah. it is, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Congressman uh, Soto, um, I, I like you know, your proposal. The problem is I don't think the Labor Department has the capacity to actually do it. Are you flexible enough to allow them to contract out to maybe one of the think tanks to actually coordinate this information in a way in which it would be nonpartisan, or the National Academy of Sciences, for example, that has issued numerous reports on artificial uh, intelligence or a combination of the two? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, and in addition, I would say we here in Congress have the ability to provide additional resources to the Department of Labor if we wanted to, but yes, I'm flexible in this. The main point of the bill is for us to get proactive with regard to where we could boost growth in AI while still uh, doing better than we were able to do with the internet, which no one could have possibly imagined what it would be now as it was in the early 90s to mid-90s. And, and so it gives us a chance to get ahead of the game for those displaced workers too. So I'm open-minded to not only this being a template for other AI ideas, but uh, who would participate to help uh, advise Congress on these sorts of issues. Exactly, and my only point is that the capacity of the Department of Labor to do these things is very limited, but their capacity to contract out with a think tank or with the National Academy of Sciences uh, to do a report like this, even where you interact with uh, business, it seems to me, any way we can get a nonpartisan report is important, but I think the, the goals of both of your reports are really important. Um, it's just that both of them are, are very complicated to do. Certainly. And forgive me for being protective of federal workers. I yield back. The lady yields back. Thank you. Are there other questions? No questions? Um, I I'll, make a, just a I'll, I'll um, just recognize myself for questions. First, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Do you know how the information you're trying to get differs from what's already on the dashboard under present law? Well, absolutely. Um, for example, enrollment information in programs is often not accurate because, as uh, the Congresswoman from Florida understands, that the iPads, what's called iPads, is less than uh, accurate or clear. It's a, it's a three-ring circus because uh, it doesn't deal well with, for example, institutions that enroll students every month rather than by the, the, the semester system. Start with that. It, uh, the collection of the data is cumbersome for universities, colleges, any post-secondary institution. They have different reporting requirements depending on the nature of the institution, so you don't necessarily get apples to apples comparisons of outcomes. And I agree that ha understanding whether or not someone's successful in going to a post-secondary to a graduate degree program is important information. Uh, my, in my college, a lot of students went on to law school. They were only guessing to be able to tell you whether they went on to law school or not because the data wasn't there. Uh, for that was a significant reason for rolling that institution. So I think it's, we can go through a whole list of data, but I think the important thing is it gathers a fairly comprehensive set of data. It may not be everything for everybody, but I assure you it's a whole lot more than we have now. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Soto, once we get the information, there will be obviously job potential and job loss. Does your um, bill tell us what to do with that information? So I would think that's in the purview of this committee, and I would think we'd want to get this within a year so that we'd still, within this term, be able to respond with thoughtful legislation, both to help grow artificial intelligence industries, but also have the workforce and retraining uh, tools deployed to areas that'll be disrupted. I'm sure everybody in this committee already has their initial opinions on where these spaces are. And if we already have all the answers, then let's just get started on that. But if we feel like we need additional information uh, from experts in an official report that then we can rely on, then this is an organized way to do it. But it would only be step one. Uh, step two would be sometime next year when we get a report back should uh, this committee uh, look favorably on this legislation would be to implement those through real dollars and real policy changes uh, in an organized way. Thank you. Are there other questions? Don't appear to be any questions. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Yeah, just uh, like to thank the witnesses for, for being here, particularly uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, do miss you on the committee. I know you've done some work on this issue in the past. I think it's very important that students, parents, 
uh, or you know, have the information in hand when they're making decisions uh, in regards to their child's education. Um, so I look forward to continuing to work with you on that. And Mr. Mr. Soto, uh, we know with AI, with robotics, uh, there will be, uh, our, our workforce will change dramatically over the next uh, decade or two. I just recently uh, visited uh, a robotics uh, uh, company developing robots that will work side by side with humans and, and they were talking about their, their projections and, and how many jobs will be uh, displaced by robots. It, it'll, be, it'll be a change in the workplace, but will be a tremendous opportunity as well. So I do think it is incumbent upon us to try to understand uh, those changes and understand how we can implement policy that ensures the workforce, uh, if folks are prepared for the jobs uh, that are available tomorrow. So I appreciate your, your work in this area as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have a second panel, which um, uh, Representative Waters has been detained on the floor, so she's expected to get here later, but I understand the gentleman from Pennsylvania has a statement and is recognized now. Thank you, Chairman. I promise to talk slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Go on time until Ms. Waters gets here. Uh, Chairman Scott, Republican Leader Smucker, and, and members of the House Education Labor Committee, I, um, uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for providing this opportunity for members to be able to bring their, their priorities before the committee. I think this is, I've always felt that this type of opportunity is extremely important, um, gives us an opportunity to share with our colleagues. Uh, as a member of the committee, I've served on this capacity since first being elected in 2009. And while the majority minority have changed hands twice since that time, I've been a steadfast in my commitment to provide honest input into the process and, and to share my my vision, my goals, and to work towards those. And we've done so in a bipartisan way. Um, uh, the things that, that, that have been important to me that I've advanced. And while we do not always agree on every issue, there are many areas where we can continue to build consensus to support programs that will improve lives and shape futures. Uh, primarily among these are areas of consensus, is a dedication to strengthen the workforce and provide Americans of all age opportunities to uh, uh, opportunities to achieve their life, full life potential. So by, I have three areas I just want to briefly uh, address. Uh, first of all is career and technical education. Uh, and I want to thank this committee for what we have done on career and technical education. Uh, as co-chair of the Bipartisan House Career and Technical Education Caucus, I strongly support CT programs that provide learners of all ages with uh, career-ready skills. From agriculture to marketing manufacturing, and manufacturing, CT programs work to develop America's most valuable resource, its people. Uh, the most valuable resource of any employer. It's not its product, service, location, compliance plan, marketing plan, it's a qualified and trained workforce. As this committee knows, CT is uh, taught in a range of settings, from high schools, area technical centers, two-year community colleges, quite frankly, in apprenticeship programs on the job. Um, I know, uh, that, that's a, it's a wonderful program that and I think this, this, this committee has reinforced a vision I've always had is looking for an education system, and career and technical education does this, that has portals that an American of any age can enter to at any time, get just what they need to make their life better, to get an advancement, a promotion, a better job, come out of that system, go to work, and maybe come back in at a, at a future point. In total, 12.5 million high school and college students um, or post-secondary students are enrolled in CT programs. Uh, fortunately, the 115th Congress unanimously passed the first major overhaul, overhaul to Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act since 2006, strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act. While well, I was the original uh, sponsor of this bill, the, the process and a, the bipartisan commitment for, to doing what is right for the American worker, uh, American families, American businesses prevailed. Now, this couldn't have been done without uh, many of my colleagues or, that are a part of and who have been a part of, of this committee. The bill was signed into law by President Trump on July 31st, 2018, and it, it uh, aims to close the skills gap by modernizing federal investment in CT programs and connecting educators with industry stakeholders. Um, we as a country need to continue to be vigilant on career and technical education. Uh, so I would like to suggest to the committee, uh, there is a bill that's been referred to this committee uh, as of uh, March 7th, 2019. It's one that 
I did uh, with a partner of mine I've worked very closely on this issue with, uh, Congressman Jim Langevin, and that is the Cybersecurity Skills Integration Act, H.R. 1592. Um, cybersecurity is an incredible emerging issue with every industry. Um, and so this creates a pilot program uh, and it continues in the spirit of what we've done. It's a partnership between employers and education uh, to, you know, to make sure that we're providing some models, incentivizing creation of the integration of cybersecurity skills into career and technical education. Child nutrition is a second area. Uh, federal, uh, and I would just ask favorable movement and consideration some hearings on HR 1592. Uh, federal child nutrition programs helps provide is another area that's very important as we all know low-income students and families those living in financial distress gives them access to nutritional meals uh, unfortunately the last several years there's been you know it's like it is time bottom line is time to reauthorize that bill uh, we reauthorize to refine uh, to make improvements where we can uh, to learn from the implementations and so uh, as so I really encourage uh, we continue as we did in the subcommittee uh, uh, just this week um, uh, to look at uh, moving on reauthorization, building towards reauthorization of what was the Healthy Hunger uh, Free Kids Act in 2010. Um, you know, one of the areas in particular to me is, uh, um, quite frankly, among the changes, uh, the law mandated that flavored milk had to be low-fat milk within the program. We know that that's contrary to, to all the research that's being published now by uh, um, almost universally. Um, so the, the science has caught up. Uh, that law that we did, along with lower participation as a result in the program, led to an alarming decline in milk consumption in schools since 2010. And, and quite frankly, putting my agriculture leadership hat on, that loss of a generation of milk drinkers as a result has been implicated in the 50% de decline in the rural economy in the past six years. Uh, cotton and agriculture, cotton and dairy uh, has had a devastating impact on rural America. So a chance to look at the science doing what's right for the kids with, uh, uh, with uh, nutrition, uh, just would encourage us to take a look at that. Obviously, the, the bill in particular uh, that is in the jurisdiction of this committee has been inter introduced, has been referred as the whole milk for healthy kids. And finally, the community services block grant reauthorization, which is near and dear to my heart. It traces its roots back more than this, to this committee more than 50 years ago to, to the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. The act established local community action agencies to help people identify why people were in poverty and how to address it, how to raise people out of poverty using public and private partnerships. Uh, virtually every county in America has a community action agency. They act as a safety net, uh, really as a catalyst for low-income individuals and families to be able to raise themselves up out of poverty. Um, and create opportunities. Uh, it is uh, the Community Services Block Grant is the only federal program with explicit goal of reducing poverty, regardless of its cause. Now, unfortunately, this program hasn't been reauthorized in more than 20 years. We all know that's unacceptable. That's why, uh, yes, uh, just this week, uh, uh, proud to work with Representative Betty McCollum. Uh, she and I have just introduced, with strong bipartisan co sponsorships, HR 1695, the Community Services Block Grant reauth reauthorization. Act of 2019. The bill aims to renew the nation's commitment to reducing poverty through an established network of more than 1,000 local community action agencies. And it's time for Congress to, to reauthorize CSPG. We've done a great job of reauthorizing bills that have been uh, laws that have been stale and, and needed to be updated, brought into the 21st century, and it's time, it really is time for CB, CSBG. Uh, thanks again, Chairman. Uh, Scott and Republican Leader Smucker and, and Republican Leader Fox, members of this committee for allowing me to express my priorities for this committee in the 116th Congress. Appreciate it. Look forward to continuing to work with you. Well, thank you, and I thank you for your leadership, particularly on CTE over, over the years. Um, do you have any questions, Mr. Smucker? Um, Mrs. Waters is apparently on her way, so why don't you briefly recess until she gets here without objection?
the committee will reconvene, and uh, we um, will inform that uh, the conflict on the floor, that's understandable. You can't be in at one place at the same time. And we're delighted to have uh, Ms. Waters uh, with us today. And you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Fox, thank you for scheduling this hearing. While this committee has jurisdiction over numerous issues of importance to my district, I will today focus on two, student loan forgiveness and the for-profit college industry. I testify before you today as someone who has long advocated for a public education system that is accessible, affordable, and equitable. Young people are sold on a simple version of this system in which students of any color and economic background attend class in a room, furnished with every necessary educational resource and tool, receive quality instruction from a dedicated and well-compensated teacher, work hard, and learn the skills and knowledge necessary to obtain gainful employment after graduation. This is the dream of millennials and young people, and this is a dream that they were sold. I now fear they were not told the truth. The ability to pay one's way through college, once a hallmark of the self-sufficient, hard-working student, is now an unattainable myth. The price of college has increased nearly 400% over the last three decades, and rising tuition leads to a dramatic and corresponding increase in student loan debt, which now totals about $1.5 trillion. This is 500 billion more than the nation's credit card debt. Perhaps if students were able to procure a job within their field of study, then such financial burdens would be worth the sacrifice. But thousands of young people, including most especially those who attended a for-profit college, the notion of obtaining employment after graduation is yet another broken promise. Millennials were promised jobs, careers, and the ability to provide for themselves and their families. They were not told the truth, and Congress now has a responsibility to address two of the primary reasons these promises never materialize, student loan debt and the for-profit college industry's fraudulent practices. I urge the committee to protect and expand student loan forgiveness programs, such as the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and forgiveness tied to bar participation in income-based repayment plans. Statistics regarding millennial student loan debt show a clear and present crisis. The average millennial with student debt has 75% less net worth than those who were debt free, those who are debt free, and 46% less in their savings and checking accounts. The average debt load per bar adjusted for inflation has increased 30% since 2001. Over one third of millennials say they have delayed purchasing a home because of student loan debt. 30% say they cannot yet afford to save for retirement, and 16% have put off having children. This debt is not distributed equi equitably either. Those from the poorest communities statistically take on the most debt, and women hold about two-thirds of all student loan debt. Forgiving all student debt owned uh, by the federal government would increase the gross domestic product by at least 86 billion per year and add a minimum 1.2 million jobs. Congress must boldly attack the student debt crisis by protecting loan forgiveness programs. For-profit colleges greatly contribute to the student debt crisis. This industry continues to receive federal funds despite destroying or disrupting the lives of millions of Americans. And I personally witnessed the effects of their abuse in my own district. In 1992 legislation, I introduced limited the number of federal funds for profit colleges could receive to 85% of their total revenue, leaving 15% of their profits to be raised either through other non-federal means. This law was later amended to the current 9010 rule. In 2011, I first proposed closing a loophole which categorizes veterans' education 
uh, benefits as a non-federal source of funding. This loophole allows for-profit college industry to enroll veterans for the GI benefits and tuition assistance without counting against the cap, limiting the amount of revenue they may receive from federal funding to 90%. I will soon introduce legislation that will both restore the original 8515 rule and count veterans' education benefits as federal funds. Both changes are long overdue. So I urge the committee to incorporate both policies into the Higher Education Act. In conclusion, I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, you don't have any questions. Um, the um, two proposals that you've made, going to 8515 and closing the veterans' loopholes, are two things that uh, we're strongly considering. So we appreciate your um, uh, your testimony on those two issues. Are there any other ways that we can ensure that the for-profits are actually delivering a quality product? Mr. Chairman, I do believe uh, that we need to scrutinize more carefully and more closely all of these for-profit colleges. As you know, um, you have and I have and we have worked uh, to make sure that some of them are, were no longer able to operate uh, because of the abuses uh, that we saw and what we learned about young people who had great expectations who attended some of these for-profit colleges only to discover uh, that in the first place, many of them did not have qualified teachers. Uh, many of them uh, could not keep the promises that they had made for giving them a quality education, and uh, they were not able uh, to get a job uh, once they had gone through, or some of them literally closed in the middle of the education that the students were supposed to be obtaining and left them stranded. And I think we have some situations like that now that we have to pay attention to. So I would just suggest that we've got to be tougher. The um, ones that collapse midstream, um, for those, the, there is um, uh, one problem that you, the students have incurred the debt, and the question is whether they need to repay the debt to the school that collapsed right in the middle of their, um, of their education. There's a borrower's defense. Uh, this administration has tried to roll that back and make it more difficult for students to access borrower's defense. Um, we need to make sure that that's stronger too, because if you if it collapses midstream, not only have you wasted all your time, but there is no excuse to make you pay for uh, the student debt for something you didn't even get. Uh, so we need to strengthen the uh, borrower's defense. On the um, uh, student loans, the uh, forgiveness programs, um, unfortunately, have been zeroed out in um, uh, in the um, by the administration. Uh, we're going to make sure they get uh, restored in our in our budget. The uh, income-based repayment and the public service loan forgiveness and other um, uh, forgiveness programs um, uh, need to be there. There's one, uh, teachers, uh, if you sign up, you can get a good education paid for by the, um, uh, get a grant conditioned on you teaching in low-income areas. Um, for five years. People are coming to the end of the five years, and there's um, an unfortunate um, denial of their grant. They said, well, we just to inform you that your grant is now a loan, pay back the money. Uh, and we're working to make sure that the teachers who have fulfilled their responsibilities get their, get their benefit. So these are two areas that uh, I appreciate your testimony. There's two areas that uh, we really need to be looking into student debt and then the abuses in the for-profit. There are some good ones, and our responsibility is to separate the good from the bad, and the veterans' uh, loophole in 8515 will not adversely affect those that are doing a good job. Those that are not doing a good job will be fearful. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your leadership and all of the wonderful work uh, that you've done uh, for all of Americans uh, on education. And I'm hopeful uh, that Ms. DeVos um, will learn a lot about uh, the for-profit industry and correct 
uh, some of the mistakes that she's made. I'm not gonna consider her an absolute enemy. I'm gonna consider that she just doesn't know any better at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other comments? Thank you very much, and I'm delighted we could work uh, with, with the floor schedule. It was a very important testimony. I want to thank our witnesses for their participation today. The input of our colleagues is paramount to what we can accomplish during this Congress. Does the ranking acting ranking member have any other comments? If, if not, um, there's no further business. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.